Welcome everyone uh, so to this tutorial. Uh, so the tutorial is leveraging propagation for data mining, models, algorithms and uh, applications. So uh, this will be presented by uh, myself, uh, Aditya Prakash and Narain Ramakrishnan who is here. We are both from Virginia Tech. And uh, uh, so, so the tutorial is, uh, as you know, it will run till 5 p.m., but we'll have a couple of breaks in the middle as uh, also structured by the conference uh, schedule. So a bit about us before we go into the topic. So uh, I am Aditya. I am an assistant professor at Virginia Tech. I did my PhD from CMU in 2012. My main research interests are in data mining and applied machine learning, uh, especially graph and time series, right? And with applications to social media, epidemiology, cybersecurity. So, so you'll see all these themes being uh, uh, repeated and emphasized multiple times during the thing because it gives my perspective on these things. Uh, and of course, uh, Narain is also the Thomas L. Phillips Professor of uh, Engineering at uh, Virginia Tech. He, he, he had his P, uh, PhD in Purdue in 97. His interests are also data mining uh, for intelligence analysis, forecasting, health informatics, and so on. So. Uh, the tutorial will be, uh, the, there is a tutorial web page which you can check throughout the tutorial talk. Uh, all the slides are posted there and the talk video, video will be also posted there as well after the tutorial. So feel free to check that out. The references are also there about what we'll, we are going to talk about today. Okay, good. So what is this tutorial about, right? So I, I don't think I need to convince you that networks are everywhere, right? Like uh, graphs are probably one of the most exciting and important topics uh, in a conference like ADD. So like you have the Facebook network, you have a gene regulatory network, you have human disease network where diseases which have, which, uh, uh, which are infected, uh, which are caused by the same uh, uh, reason are joined together, the internet, all of these are graphs, right? But the main point about this tutorial is that uh, dynamical processes of our networks are also everywhere, right? So what does that mean, right? So dynamical processes are something which spread over a graph, right? Probably a disease, a contagion, influence, information, say what you want, right? So something which is happening over the top of the graph. Why do we care that? Why do we care about it? So dynamical processes can be important for social collaboration when you want to sh make sure that the entire network gets some social information. It, of course, information diffusion, viral marketing, epidemiology, cybersecurity, so on and so forth, right? In all these fundamental applications, the main concept of dynamical processes over graphs is a, uh, is a very, very useful uh, uh, abstraction. So let me uh, try to give you uh, some sense of what I'm talking about, right? So, uh, more specifically, suppose epidemiology, right? Epidemiology means like you're studying diseases over contact networks. For example, this guy's connect, sorry. Uh, this guy's connect, I think this is, maybe this is a better thing, right? So this is a contact network where these two people are connected by an edge if they come in contact with each other, right? Contact means that, okay, maybe we are in physical proximity, so we are able to spread germs from one to another, right? So suppose this guy gets infected, uh, by some reason, maybe he or she spreads the infection to one of his friends and so on and so forth, right? So suppose at the end of this, these three people get infected. So this is a very easy way of studying how diseases will spread. And, and this is a very powerful way as well, right? So if you think of it in terms of graphs and uh, uh, dynamical processes, for example, on the right-hand side, this is a visualization of the first 35 tuberculosis patients in Atlanta, uh, CDC Centers for Disease Control. And this was a snapshot in 2007. Uh, and, and you can immediately see, uh, so the pink ones are the ones who got the disease, the black ones are the ones who died, unfortunately, and the green ones were not infected. So this is a contact network, and just one look at this network, and it's uh, easy to say maybe who might have been the patient zero, right? Who might have started the epidemic. For example, this looks like this guy, right, in the middle. So thinking of disease spreading over contact network as a dynamical process helps you to answer many non-trivial questions which may not have been uh, so obvious if you look at it just as a list or sequence of patients, right? So the contact network is important. And what kind of uh, questions can you answer, further questions? So, so suppose this is a graph of uh, US Medicare hospitals where there is an edge between hospital if they transfer patients among each other, right? And suppose in a very high level abstract setting, you are given K units of disinfectant. It can be any resource. It can be money, man hours. It can be uh, resources like doctors, nurses, whatever, right? And how, how do you spread? How do you spread these resources, right? So that you control the spread of any disease which are being carried over by the patients as well as possible. So currently, people don't really look at it from a contact network viewpoint, right? And the current practice, in fact, just says, give all hospitals equal number of resources. Just divide up the resources as equally as possible, uniformly as possible among all hospitals. Again, just one look at the network and it's easy to realize that not all hospitals are created equal. Some hospitals are more important than others, right, in, in, in stopping the spread of the disease. For example, the Mayo Clinic here 
or the Cleveland Clinic may be more important than some other clinic somewhere here, right? So that's the idea. So you can utilize the way the disease spreads to, to come up with these resource allocations so that you can like almost like for example here uh, I've shown you our method which we published in 2013 which says almost you can get 6x fewer infections if you spread the, allocate the resources based on uh, the way diseases spread. Of course, uh, online diffusion is a um, very major example also of uh, a dynamical process of the network where really the process is the information spreading over the network, right? And based on this, there has been so, I mean, it has a large economic impact as well, right? So these are, uh, 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 oh, numbers are a bit old, but now like Facebook counts more than a billion users, right? Twitter and LinkedIn both are very, very big uh, social networks. And what is the dynamical process here, right? So this, you can think of it like uh, viral marketing. So suppose this is the celebrity who has a lot of uh, followers, and uh, the celebrity of his or her own volition says by Varshasha, right? Maybe that celebrity was paid or just tweeted about because they liked it. And the followers go ahead and buy these things and everybody is happy, right? Because the followers, because they bought something their celebrity has or likes and the celebrity because they get money from the company and the company because people are buying stuff from them, right? So, and the Twitter because you're using their platform to do all this. So it's a net win-win for everybody. And we are also happy because we can study them, right? So again, uh, and in the recent past, you can also think of dynamical process over social collaboration, right? Where you can, people have collaboratively uh, done some action like protests or, uh, or events, right? And uh, again, dynamical process can play a big role there and understanding how these things happen. So the main uh, theme of the talk is that it's a very high impact uh, uh, area with multiple settings, right? And there are similar questions in many, many different applications. For example, how do you squash rumors can be thought of how do you squash epidemic outbreaks better, right? How do you, how do opinions spread? Can be how do products or viruses spread, right? How do we market better? Can be also thought of how do you transmit software patches better, right? So similar questions, of course, there are differences depending on the domain, right? The particular details, but similar questions, but the overarching concept is the same, that you want to leverage that phenomenon. So what's the theme, right? What's the research theme from which we are presenting this information, right? So there is this data, Right? Of course, you need to collect data about these real world processes and actions. You collect lots of data like tweets and so on and so forth. You analyze them, you build models, you try to maybe prove interesting things about the models you under, to, to understand this, uh, these, uh, these data sets. Right? But finally, there is this nice feedback loop that you want to use this model to do something useful, which is like build, to actually manage, actually devise policy and actions based on how these models behave. Like for example, how do you allocate resources, right? So that's an action, a policy which you devise based on your understanding of how do diseases spread, right? So in public health, this can be modeling the number of patient transfers. That's the data, right? So you get patient transfer data between all the hospitals and you try to understand them. Then you build models and then you try to analyze, will an epidemic happen? Is, is this a setting where an epidemic can happen, right? And finally, you leverage that understanding to build policy and action. How do you control these outbreaks better? How does this look like in social media? Similar setting, right? S similar questions, just a different setting. Data can be modeling tweet spreading, right? How, how, like you collect who tweeted what at what time, and that's it, right? That's your log of tweets. That's your data. Your analysis would be, can you predict the number of cascades in future? Can you predict, how, will this hashtag take off? Will this hashtag become viral? And so on and so forth, right? And the policy and action, can, how do you market better? And given your understanding of what sticks and what doesn't, can you actually market your product better? So ultimately, you want to do all these three things together, right? And in fact, once you devise the technique to market better, that feeds in and changes the data as well. So there is a nice cycle going on here, right? Which affects, and your decisions affect every part of the cycle. Okay, good. So this is the big picture, but coming, in, co coming to this tutorial, these are the things which we'll try to touch upon in all these three different aspects, right? Theory, algorithms, and uh, uh, applications, right? So first of all, we'll talk about fundamental models because this sets the stage for more complicated uh, and, uh, algorithms and applications on which we'll build upon uh, these things, right? So the questions we are trying to mainly answer in this part is given propagation models on arbitrary networks because we are dealing with real networks, not theoretical networks like random graphs only. Uh, what is the epidemic threshold? So it will become clear uh, what I really mean by that, but it's roughly will a virus take off or not? How do viruses compete? So if there are multiple viruses spreading on a, a network, how do you compete? How do they compete? What happens in the end? And with extensions to dynamic networks, multi-profile networks, and so on. So these, th this, this, the first part of the talk will be focusing on uh, mostly fundamental models and uh, 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 results. The second part of the talk would be, be on managing and manipulating these uh, processes, right, using algorithms. 
So how do you estimate and learn influence and networks, right? How do you immunize and control outbreaks better? How do you reverse engineer epidemics, right? How do you leverage viral marketing? How do you do the viral marketing in the best way? How do you pick sensors for graphs, right? So all of these questions are related uh, to algorithmic questions given some uh, models and data sets, right? And finally, which is a big part of this tutorial, is applications. So, so our focus on this in this tutorial would be on part two and part three, which is algorithms and applications. So here, how do you use propagation for memes, tweets, and blog mining, right? How do you use propagation for disease surveillance? How do you use propagation for protest trends, right? So can you predict the number of protests in a given uh, geographical area depending on uh, using propagation-based concepts? How do you use propagation for predicting the number of malware attacks? If I give you a database of malware attacks, can you predict which, how many computers will be infected by what kind, say what you want malware and get this in one week in future, right? So, and how do you use propagation for general graph mining? So, so the focus on this, uh, this part would be to basically tell you how do you use propagation for your own favorite problem, right? In different domains. So that's the big part. The plan, uh, the logistics would be that we'll have three breaks because uh, I think everybody needs a break right, from time to time. Uh, even the speakers, so two to two five, we'll be, have a short break, like a five minute break uh, in an hour roughly. Then we'll have the conference, of course, mandated coffee break from three to 3.30 p.m. And then we reconvene, and then we have another break at 4.15 to 4.20 p.m., right? So, uh, and this is to help you plan if you're interested in different parts of the proposal. That uh, part two, the algorithm part will start roughly at 150, 145, 150, that's the goal. Then the applications part, which is part three, will start at 3.30, right, after the coffee break. Or, and please interrupt any time for questions. Uh, we have tried to ensure that uh, uh, we cover the latest results here, the latest uh, the state of the art uh, algorithms and methods and models here. So feel free to interrupt any time for questions uh, and uh, we'll also prompt you on that. So sounds good? Great. So let's start with uh, uh, the first part, right? Understanding epidemics, which is on the th uh, a little bit on the theoretical part, which is like fundamental models, fundamental characterizations of these models on networks. Right. So as I said, we'll focus on two main questions here. One is, what is the epidemic threshold, right? So what is this question? It's, just a, it's a very fundamental question and a very natural question if you think uh, for five minutes, right? Suppose you have this graph, right? And there is a strong virus, a virulent virus, right? Which is, which is infecting a lot of people. Uh, this guy gets infected, quickly a large portion of the graph gets infected, right? So is there an epidemic? Yes, there is an epidemic, right? A lot of people have gotten infected. Now, suppose on the same graph, the same contact network, right? Again, this guy is in contact. That means this guy can spread the disease to this person, right? And note that the edge weights are different, right? So some edges are stronger. You are closer to your family members than probably your acquaintance, right? So th that is what this denotes. Now, suppose there is a weak virus. Now, will there be an epidemic? Probably not, right? This person maybe infects one more person and the, and the disease dies out, right? So there is not really an epidemic. So this is the fundamental question which you are trying to answer when there will be an epidemic and when there will not be an epidemic, right? Given parameters of a contact network and a virus. That's it, that's the main, main problem, right? So if you plot the number of infected people in a network versus time, there, there are clearly two different regimes. One is which when there is an epidemic, the red curve, and one there when there is no epidemic and the virus dies out, right? And the problem statement really is find a condition under which a virus will die out exponentially quickly regardless of the initial infection condition, right? And this is what is called the uh, separating the regimes, and this is called the epidemic threshold, right? So that's out of the threshold. So in static version, so what, what it technically means is that you are assuming that the contact network is not changing. Uh, the problem is given a graph G and a virus specs, suppose a model, attack probability, recover probability, and so on, find a condition for virus extinction and invasion, right? So why, why is this threshold important? It's sure, it looks fundamental and intuitive, but why is it really important? So it's important because you can accelerate simulations based on it, right? So if you can quickly predict before the simulation even started that this simulation will not lead to an epidemic, there's no point studying this regime, then that saves time, right? And it's time and resources. It can also help in forecasting, right? Again, if the regime is under below the epidemic, then you don't need to worry about that disease much, right? They can have a less aggressive policy response. And of course, uh, as we'll see later, and this is important, that this is a great handle to manipulate the spreading, right? So for, a, for a example, immunization. If you want to distribute vaccines to control the spread of any disease, then understanding when the disease will take off and cause an epidemic is also very important, right? So is the contact network built for that? Okay, good. 
So uh, before I go into the result and intuition, I, I'll do a bit of background to just to give you a sense of what kind of models we are talking about, right? So the big picture is clear, which is given a model and a graph, tell me, find a condition under which the virus, regardless of any starting point, starting conditions dies out, right? So I have given you one of the most uh, uh, fundamental models, which is the SIR model, so-called, which is a susceptible infected recovered or the removed, you can say both. Uh, what it means is that each uh, node in the graph, in the contact graph, ha is one in three states, right? It can be susceptible, infected, susceptible means healthy, infected, that means that node can infect other people, its neighbors in the network, and removed, that means the node cannot get infected again, right? So that's, that's why it's called SIR. So uh, a thematic, schematic representation, uh, representation would maybe something like this, right? S, uh, a healthy node gets infected with rate beta from each of its neighbors, and goes to I and then goes to R, right? So how does this look on the contact network? So here the network is just a star, so like a star network. So this is the network, this is the node which is infected in the middle. Then this node infects other people with probability beta. So that's the assumption of the model. So the attack rate here in this model is beta. That means every infected node infects each of its neighbors independently with the rate probability beta. That's it, very simple and intuitive understanding. At the same time, there is a curing rate in this model, which says that every infected person cures himself at the rate delta, right? That's it. So at time two, maybe this guy spreads the infection to this uh, friend of uh, uh, that node, and at time is equal to three, this node gets recovered. So just by looking at this, you can clearly figure out that the infection cannot really spread anymore in this graph, right? That's it, because there is no other uninfected neighbor of this node, right, in this contact network. So this disease cannot really spread. So the disease has kind of died down in at least this network, right? So of course, as you can imagine, as you uh, might very well imagine, there are many, many different virus propagation models, and clearly I cannot go over all of them, right? But they all share certain characteristics. So one of them is like SIS, SIRS, so SIRS kind of uh, uh, models temporary immunity, SIS models no immunity, like flu, that you can get it this year, then you can get it next year as well, because the strain slightly changes, but not that much. Then the SEIR is mumps-like, so where uh, you have virus incubation and so on and so forth, right, and underlying contact network. Okay, so this problem obviously is a very fundamental problem, as I said, has been studied for quite a long time, right? It's been studied for two or three, I mean, 30, 20, 30 years, right? But all of these uh, methods are either about structured topologies, that means they assume that the contact network might be cliques, block diagonals, random graphs, or hierarchical graphs, and so on and so forth, right? All important work, but all assume structured topologies, or specific virus propagation models, right? We say that, okay, if the virus is like this, then this will happen. Or, very, or static graphs, right? Which says that oh, the graphs don't change. So what I'll show you later is how do you generalize over all these three axes, right? And you can get a very generic general result which you can use for many, many different applications. In fact, part of the tutorial is to show that how analysis of these models, general analysis on arbitrary networks can help you to build efficient, robust, scalable algorithms later, right? So that's, that's one of the things which we want to show. Okay, so what's the result in the intuition, right? So how should the answer look like? So if you, if you start thinking about this problem in a general way, how should the answer look like? The answer should clearly depend on the graph as well as the model, right? So if I give you a stronger virus, it will cause an epidemic no matter the graph. But the graph also is important. For example, stars seem to be, chains and stars seem to have different rates of susceptibleness to epidemics, right? So clearly, if everybody's talking to everybody else, then the epidemic can go off very fast. But if nobody talks to anybody else, everybody are, become hermits and live in their houses, then of course nothing will cause an epidemic, right? because only, even if a guy gets infected, it can never spread. So clearly, you, you want the answer to depend both on contact network as well as the uh, virus uh, model. But really, the question is how exactly, right? So for the graph, is the average degree important? Sounds reasonable and intuitive, right? Higher the degree, yep, more, better the chances of a virus to spread. Max degree diameters, again, so how do you combine them, so on and so forth, right? So, so the basic question is that it's, 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 it's uh, the intuition is there, but it's really the, the, the question is how do you really get this, what, what really characterizes the uh, threshold, right? So here's the main result, which was in 2011. Informally, for any arbitrary topology, right, represented by its adjacency matrix. So adjacency matrix is just telling you what edges are there in the matrix, right, who is connected to whom. So in this matrix, 
and for any virus propagation model in standard literature, right? So you can get this and you can denote the adjacency matrix by a single number, lambda, which is the spectral radius. I'll, I'll, I'll come uh, in a couple of slides what spectral radius intuitively means, but this is the mathematical statement and see uh, this and any virus propagation model can be represented by a constant. So every model has a different constant, right? So we give an algorithm of how do you generate that co constant. So let's not focus too much there. For any of this, there is no epidemic if this times this is less than one. A very simply stated result, right? So no, there won't be any epidemic if lambda times the constant is less than one. That's it, right? So what does this mean, right? So if I want to instantiate this result for certain models, this is how it will look like, right? So you can call the product lambda times constant as effective strength. So what you're saying is if S is less than one, then it's below threshold, right? So SIS, SIR, SIRS, all these models have different parameters, different things, but what it matters is just two things, right? The attack rate and the curing rate. So it's lambda times beta by delta. For SIV, this is a generalization. You have a much more complicated result. And of course, uh, and you can also have multiple infectious states and so on. Like in HIV, there is a terminal state and a non-terminal state. So both of them have different parameters acting upon them, right? So, but in all of them, if you do this and it becomes less than one, then it is, there won't be an epidemic. That's the main takeaway, right? But, uh, so and, and everywhere the lambda comes into picture. But what's the intuition for lambda? Where did this lambda come from, right? So official definition, if you look up a linear algebra textbook, it's this, right? If A is the adjacency matrix, lambda is the root with the largest magnitude, right? Of the characteristic polynomial of the determinant of A minus Xi, right? So very standard definition, but of course, doesn't give much intuition. The unofficial definition is uh, lambda is roughly the number of paths in the graph, right? So what it means is that if you have A, right, that the adjacency matrix, let's say this, right? If you have the adjacency matrix, and you, and you raise it to the kth power, right? You say A times A times A K times, right? So what, 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 any, what, is, what does any cell represent? Any i jth element of this A to the power K matrix represent, right? So if you use the spectral decomposition, then it's roughly equal to lambda to the power K times U times U, right? U times U transpose, right? So of course, this is very roughly, right? So A to the power K i j is roughly the number of paths from I to J of length K, right? Of course, there are repeated paths, there are cycles, all kinds of paths, right? It's not just simple paths. But forget about that distinction for a moment, right? But roughly A to the power K i j is the number of paths from I to J of length K. So what it means is that if the lambda is higher, then this value is higher, right? So there are more paths. And that's really roughly the intuition, that if higher lambda, the better the connectivity for the virus and hence uh, it'll be about, and it's better for the virus to spread, and that's why it'll be above threshold. So how does this look like for specific graphs? Suppose there is a chain, right? So chain is roughly constant. Chain, the eigenvalue doesn't really depend on the number of nodes in that chain, right? So even if, and this makes sense, right? Intuitively, if you add more nodes to a chain, the fundamental characteristic of the chain does not change, right? It's not as if you can suddenly in, uh, infect a lot more nodes because you are adding nodes to the ends of the chain because it, they are further and further apart. On the other hand, star is different, right? Star intuitively seems like you, it's very flammable. If you infect the center of the star, then you can quickly reach the rest of the network, right? But not really if you in, infect the spokes. Then you need to infect the center and then go on. And clique seems to be the best case for the virus, right? If you infect anybody in the clique, everybody else can get infected because everybody is connected to each other. So, and that is borne out by the lambda as well, right? that lambda for a chain is, uh, is uh, constant, lambda for a star grows as root n, and lambda for a, a clique grows as order n, right? So clearly, uh, th the clique is the best case, and hence, you get these thresholds. So uh, you, uh, you can also, do, so this is just a demonstration of the result on spe a specific uh, uh, situation. So you can say this is simulation, so you, inf you implement the model and run it on a big contact network. For example, we ran it on the Portland graph. So this is a famous graph which has been used for many different national level studies. Uh, and you can see that there are like, th um, it's a big graph, right? It represents the city of Portland roughly and which tells you how people uh, come in contact there and how do they move in that city, right? So if you infect, if you implement the SIR model on this and you plot like uh, the, the, this is the time and this is the fraction of infections per unit time, you can see that above threshold you can get a widely different behavior and below threshold, you get a very different behavior. But of course, this does not tell you where the threshold is. This is the plot which tells you that. If you plot the footprint, which is the number of people getting infected at the end, uh, with the effective strength, which is the, uh, the, the product which I was talking, uh, telling you about, S, right? 
So clearly at S is equal to one, this is where the epidemic suddenly starts happening. There's a phase transition, right? Suddenly there are a lot of people getting infected before. And, so before the uh, S is equal to one, there is almost no one. After S is equal to one, it suddenly jumps. So that's, that's the phase transition we wanted to capture, yes. Yes, yes, average over many, many runs. Yes, this is discrete time, yes. So, but uh, there are, you can extend, try to extend this on continuous time models. So, but, but you're right, this is discrete time models, so just to keep things simple. Uh, similarly, you can, you can get the SIRS model as well, right? So see, the plots are very, very different here, right? So in, in the SIR model, there is a peak and then it comes down because there are fewer and fewer people available to be infected, right? Because people get removed after infections. But in SIRS, it's no, no, nothing like that, right? In SIRS, because people can get infected again, there is a steady state. But, but that's the main point. It does not matter for the threshold, right? For the threshold, the threshold is still at 10 power zero, which is one, right? At S is equal to one. Before the threshold, there is no steady state. And after the threshold, there is a steady state, right? So that, that's the most important characterization. So I'm not trying to predict the number of people infected here, right? I'm just trying to predict whether there'll be a sudden phase transition between an epidemic where a lot of people get infected to a very few people getting infected. That's, so th this is, that is this question, right? Okay, great. So I won't, I won't talk about too much about the proof ideas, but I, 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 I'll, I'll just try to give you some sense of what it involves to prove this, right? So, so that you, uh, you get a sense of what kind of tools and techniques you will need. But I won't go into the details, right? Feel free to read the paper if uh, you want. So uh, the proof sketch, right? So the proof sketch really is that you have two different things coming in here, right? Like you have a contact network and you have the model and both of them together give you the lambda times cons CVPM less than one result, right? So the uh, main idea is that you try to generalize the virus propagation structure, right? You have all these virus propagation models, but all of them share a very specific structure and you can generalize them successfully. And that's one of the main points of the paper that you can generalize a tractable version of all of these models which is the general VPM structure. And then you can also use nonlinear dynamical system theory, which tells you when a particular nonlinear system is stable or not. And what it means is that if you're above threshold, you're not stable. And if you're below threshold, you're stable. That's the main point. So the topology and stability part gives you the graph-based part of the result, and the model-based result comes from the generalization. So uh, I'll quickly go over what, 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 what both these threads, right? So the first thread, as I said, there are models and there are more and more models, but all of them can be sort of generalized using a general state diagram, which is, which we call as S star I square V star, which says that they can have any number of susceptible nodes, only two infected nodes. So you might ask why only two? This is to make the model tractable, but we can extend this. And any number of V nodes, which is vigilant nodes, right? Like removed, who you cannot infect again. So again, I will, I will not uh, go into details, but the ingredients of a generalized model is that you, the main thing we need to recognize is that there are only very specific kinds of transitions allowed in every model, right? For example, you cannot get infected on your own. You need to be near an infected person, right? So this is one ingredient of the model, right? So if you just adopt this, mo this ingredient of the model, you can immediately cut down and make a generalization on that. Similarly, the other thing, so there is an endogenous transitions, transitions which don't depend on a neighbor, and they are exogenous transitions, which depend on a neighbor. So carefully understanding which ones are allowed and which ones cannot be allowed helps you to generalize these models. So this is the model, as I said, a susceptible infected vigilant, and uh, so special case, for example, would be SIR. SIR will look like this. The red wavy curve is the exogenous transitions, right, which happen due to a neighbor. And the black curves are the ones which happen, with, you don't need a neighbor to happen that. Okay, good. So this gives you uh, one case, right? SIR, HIV, multiple infection, vision state, and so on. Okay, good. The second ingredient of a proof is NDLS, right? Nonlinear dynamical systems and stability theory. So what, what's the idea? The idea here is view the simulation, view the model on the graph as a nonlinear dynamical system. That's the main idea, right? So what does that mean? That means that the probability of each node being in any of the M states at t plus one depends on a big nonlinear function g of the previous probability, right? That's it. So at any given point, your probability of being infected roughly depends on in a big nonlinear complex way to whatever the probabilities were there in the graph at time t. That's it, right? And this is discrete time nonlinear system. So what does this probability vector mean, right? The probability vector means just specifies the state of the system at time t. That's it, nothing more, right? So for example, if you have three states, it says, the probability of node one to belong in S. 
the probability of node 1 to belong in i, the probability of node 1 to belong in v, right? That's it. So as every node in the graph can belong in one of three states, so of course these three probabilities will add to 1, right? So that's fine. Okay, good. So what is g? g is a nonlinear function which explicitly gives the evolution of the system, right? So it tells you that if I give pt, I'll apply g and I'll get pt plus 1. So view the disease spread as a nonlinear dynamical system. That's the main idea. That's it, right? Once you do that, why do you do that, right? Once you do that, the nice thing is that nonlinear dynamical systems have been studied for like a lot of time, right? 100 years or more. And the idea there is that you can immediately characterize when a nonlinear dynamical system is stable or unstable and so on and so forth, right? So what does unstable mean, right? So suppose this is the force field and this is the nonlinear dynamical system then clearly at this point this system is unstable because a sudden push, a sudden perturbation will lead to an increase in velocity or whatever you want to call it in that system, right? And, and the inst uh, system will take off. Whereas this force field is inherently stable, right? If you push the ball a little bit up, it'll try to come back, right? Because the force is pulling it back to the stable point. Whereas this is neutral. So the idea is that you convert the threshold problem to a stability of the nonlinear dynamical system problem, right? So you convert the threshold problem to the stability problem on this system. That's it, right? And then analyze it. And you have uh, techniques from uh, nonlinear system theory to analyze these questions. So I won't go into detail, but special case SIR, you can get, I'll just give you a run through of how the G will look like. The G looks something like this. So G on this will give you PT plus one. This is the nonlinear system. The fixed point, that is a state when no node is infected, is some, is, and the question you are asking is, is it stable? That's the threshold problem, right? You are asking the question when no node is infected, is this a stable point? So if it is under threshold, this is how it will look like, right? So suppose this is the probability of node 1 getting infected, this is the probability of node 2, and this corresponds to the stable point, right? So if you perturb the model a little bit, what does that physically mean? It means that you infect one node in the graph. If you infect one node in the graph, you increase the probability of everybody in the node getting in, everybody in the graph getting infected, right? So you have perturbed the system, right? It's a stable point, so it tries to come back. So this is below threshold, simple. On the other hand, if it's an unstable point above threshold, a certain perturbation will lead to more and more nodes getting infected, right? And it'll take off, right? That's it. So there is already theory in nonlinear systems to actually characterize these two regimes very cleanly, right? And that's what we used. So using all of this, you can clearly get two different systems. Okay, good. So the main takeaway from this is that the epidemic threshold for arbitrary networks for almost any model depends on lambda and a constant, right? Okay, good. So as I said, we'll see later in the uh, part two and three of this uh, tutorial, how do you use these, uh, these the results for other applications, right? So next, how do you extend this to dynamic graphs? Dynamic graphs means what? Like you have a, so we, the, the only thing we studied uh, till now was that the contact network was static, but that's really not the realistic case. Contact network change. You are in this tutorial from one to five, I'm assuming, and then you will go for dinner or whatever, right? Or other tutorials. So the contact network will change, right? People you come in contact changes. So that's, that's what you want to model as well in real life. So in day, maybe you have a work adjacency matrix. Parents go to work, children go to school. So you'll have something like this. But in night, everybody comes home, so you might have a different network of uh, people interacting with each other, right? So you have adjacency matrices corresponding to different snapshots of your contact uh, uh, system. Again, suppose you have an SIS model for sake of simplicity, and you have a set of T arbitrary graphs, right? A1 to AT, and you assume A1 to AT repeat, right? So you can have A1, day, night, weekend, vacation, KDD, semester, right? Okay, just a second. So the question we are trying to answer here is that will an epidemic happen given this system, right? There's a flu spreading on this set of graphs and now will an epidemic happen? Using similar techniques, you can extend that result and you get something like this. Informally, there is no epidemic if the eigenvalue of some system matrix, eigenvalue of S is less than one. And what is this? And again, note that this is a single number, less than one, and the system matrix is something like this. S is product of SIs, where each SI is one minus delta I plus beta AI. So again, don't focus too much on the details of the SI, but the idea is that it's a product of adjacency matrices roughly, intuitively. And if the eigenvalue of that is less than one, then there won't be an epidemic. Again, simulations, you can, so we uh, use, so these are synthetic simulations and this is on MIT Reality Network. So this is, uh, was collected by, I think, uh, Alex Penteland's group uh, where they gave each undergraduate at MIT one phone, Bluetooth phone, and whenever two Bluetooths come, come in contact with each other, then you 
say that 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 uh, were near each other, then they have come in contact, right? So there, an infection. This is useful for studying uh, mobile phone viruses, right? So you can see that at threshold, it's kind of constant. Below threshold, the virus dies out, and above threshold, it kind of stays uh, uh, constant, right? And synthetic simulations also give you the same answer. So, and uh, if you want to plot the takeoff plots, right? So this is the lambda of that product, lambda of the system matrix, and this is the num footprint, that is the number of infected at steady state. You can see that at threshold, which is one, it suddenly there is a phase transition, right? There is a nice S curve. And similarly in the real data set as well. So, and this is our predicted threshold. So you, you can clearly see that it does a pretty good job of, uh, of uh, uh, characterizing these uh, dynamic graphs as well. So of course, you can imagine that you can extend this kind of analysis to many different settings, which people have done, and people have also tried to study it in different settings. So there was a paper in 2015, last year in KDD, where they tried to extend this to multiple profile networks, right, by RAPT et al. So the setting is that you're not fair place. You have same network, multiple profiles. So what does that mean? That suppose a PS4 tweet comes on Twitter network. How many of you are familiar with PS4? Okay, not too many. So that's what I expected, right, because, uh, so PS4 is PlayStation, right? So PlayStation 4 comes on Twitter network, so it's a big deal in the real world, I think. Uh, <laughs> uh, where PS4, who are fans are very positive because there's a big uh, jump over whatever was going on in the uh, thing. People like me and my brother may not care about it because we don't know about what PS4 means. But Xbox fans, on the other hand, may be hostile, right? So if there is an information or a virus spreading on a network, uh, some people might be, uh, uh, interested in that virus and want to spread it. Some people might be actively disinterested and actively also anti, right? So they might not want the virus to propagate and they might have their own virus. So this is what they are setting, right? That in the same network, different people can have different propensities to the virus, right? That's what they want to study. So there are different betas and deltas for different profiles. You can think of it like that. If I get infected with Xbox, maybe I will not spread it, but if a, uh, Xbox, fa Xbox fan gets infected, he or she will try to spread it to other people, right? So what, what was their main result? The main result is the situation becomes much more complex, right? That high sensitivity in one profile, so if there are enough Xbox haters, then you can kill off PS4, right? That was one of the main results from their thing. But how, exactly how you characterize this using mathematics, that's, that's something I'll leave it up to you if you want to uh, read the paper. It's, it's a very complex result. So the main takeaway is that high sensitivity in one profile and low in another can still lead to an epidemic, okay? That's, that's the main idea. So it depends on the proportion of Xbox haters and PS4 likers in the uh, network. Okay, so what happens when viruses compete, right? So this is like the network has two different profiles. But what if there are two different viruses on the network, right? Where Apple, iPhone, or Android, right? So there are ap Apple and Android uh, word of mouth processes going on the network and you're trying to predict how many iPhones will be sold, how many uh, Android users will be made. So let's uh, consist the simpler uh, case, uh, consider the simpler case, which is the mutually exclusive viruses. So think of it as iPhone spreading on a network and Android spreading on a network, and you're trying to predict, okay, who will gain the m most market share, right? So this can be also thought of in uh, army setting as attack versus retreat, right? Two, there are two different decisions which need to be communicated to the army as soon as possible in the army hierarchy of social, uh, 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 social hierarchy, and you're trying to uh, predict which happens, will, which will be spread uh, at the end, right? There are, of course, biological uh, motivations, right? So you can say the common flu, avian flu, versus the pneumococcal flu, and so on. Okay, so a very simple model. Again, the, uh, the, the goal of the analysis is to really tease out the main uh, interesting uh, properties of the model, right, of any different model. So what the particular models I'm taking here are very just examples, right? They are, they, I'm not trying to say this is the right model, but the point is that even this simple model can show complex properties. That's the main point, right? So this is a modified flu-like model. So this is, you can see, this is the S I1, I2S. So a healthy guy, a guy who does not have any phone can adopt either the iPhone or either the Android, right? That's the main uh, thing. So there is mutual immunity. That means you have to pick one of the two. If you have an iPhone, you don't have an Android, right? If you want to get an Android, you'll give up the iPhone, become susceptible, and then go and buy an Android, right? So that's, that's, that's the main uh, property of this model. So suppose this is the model going on a network. Right? And the question you are asking is what happens in the end? So this is the number of infections, this is the time. Let's assume virus one is stronger than virus two, just for the sake of argument, right? Virus one is a stronger virus. So this and this is strong, sorry, this is stronger than this, right? So let's, let's assume. Maybe it's a better product, right? That's why it's a stronger virus. Now, what I want to ask you is that, okay, there is a green virus and there is a red virus, right? 
what's the footprint at the steady state, the ratios of the footprint at the steady state? Any guess? Right? So you extrapolate this red virus, you extrapolate the green virus. So what I'm asking is what is this ratio at the end? That's the question I'm trying to ask, right? At the end, what happens? So this length by this length, what do you think will be the ratio? Any idea? Okay, that's, that's, that's what I had in the first, that's great. So the, it can be a ratio of the strength. So if you have a, tw a product which is twice as good as the competitors, maybe your market share will be twice as much as the competitors, a very reasonable assumption, right? Anything else? You can also extend this to strength square, right? Or whatever you want, but actually in, in this model, none of them is true. What happens is winner takes all, right? So what does this mean? That even if you have a slight competitive, competitive advantage over one of your uh, competitors, then you, you can, in, in a f perfectly fair play world, you can annihilate them, right? So, and a winner will take all. At the end, the red one goes down because it's a weaker virus and the green one takes over. Even though at the beginning, you can see that the red one was above the green one, right? At the beginning, it just so happened, maybe because the red one was released before the green one or so on and so forth, the green one eventually takes over, right? So this is one of the main results. So this we had in 2012 in WWW, which given our model and e-graph, the weaker virus dies out completely. The stronger survives only if itself is above threshold, and the threshold is the same as before, lambda, beta by delta, right? The other examples, you can see like Reddit versus DIG, Blue Ray versus HDD, HDVD, HDDVD, I mean, you can see clearly Christmas sales. So this is real data, of course, it will not correspond exactly to the model, right? For example, these are Christmas sales, that's why the, there's this periodic peak. So if you remove all of that, then you can see the same thing, right? Even though this was higher, this will eventually take off and that will die out. So, so you can extend this analysis to interacting viruses. So remember in this uh, setting, we assume that the viruses don't interact. If you have an iPhone, you don't have an Android, but that might not be true in many, many cases, right? So you can have both Chrome, Internet Explorer, Firefox on your uh, laptop, and I mean, you may, you may use both, right? Uh, and you may use one exclusively and so on and so forth. So here again, the question is what happens in the end? And here the answer becomes a bit more murkier, right? So when epsilon zero, which is the interaction between the viruses, when there is no interaction, then we know that winner takes all, right? That's what we proved in the previous paper. But if there is one, then they coexist independently. That means that if, you, if cro having Chrome helps you to have Firefox, of course you will have both, right? And both of them increases your uh, uh, satisfaction, then you'll have both. But what if there is some regime between where, right? It, where the cooperation is not there, the interaction is between zero and one, is there a point where both viruses can coexist? So here, both are not existing, the winner takes all. Here, both are existing, right? So the natural question is, is there a phase transition? And the answer, as you might expect, that yes, there is a phase transition, which is called epsilon critical, right? So before epsilon critical, only one of the viruses survives, so this virus survives, this virus dies out. But after the epsilon critical, both can survive, right? Depending on what is the level of interaction. So think of razors and blades, right? That they cooperate. So if you buy a razor, you have to get a blade, right? So that's cooperation. So one product helps the other product. But what if both viruses don't really cooperate, but they interact? Where, like for example, Chrome and Firefox, then that explains why both of them had a reasonable steady state market share, right? Because they cooperate, but they, uh, they, they, they don't cooperate fully, they don't compete fully, they interact in the middle, right? So that's, that's the point. Okay, good, so I'll skip all of this. Okay, so our result is given a model uh, and a fully connected graph. There exists an epsilon critical such that for epsilon greater than epsilon critical, there is a fixed point when both viruses survive. So that's the technical result. You can think of it in like this also, right? Hulu blockbuster and so on. Okay, so we can also extend this to composite networks like phone calls plus SMS, power grid plus telecom network. So there is a, a failure cascade or a virus spreading on the power grid network. How does it interact with a telecommunication network, right? Which is going on the top of it. So you can analyze such more complex settings as well. I'm not going into detail with all of that, but the basic technique and the basic viewpoint is more or less the same that you try to understand when a virus, when an epidemic will happen, when there will be a giant component and so on. The main result is that the behavior depends on viral strengths in different networks, which makes sense, right? Which is a very intuitive result, that uh, the behavior of each virus depends on how strong that virus is uh, on each of the networks and also this interaction between the networks, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, that's a very good question. So, I mean, yeah, so the, the, in the model you can do that. 
in the model you can do that, but in real life it's a harder question. So there you need data, right? But but you can do that. So that, that that's one of the things we'll discuss in applications. That how do you how do you do that? But but yeah, it's a very fair question. That okay, if they coexist, what is the proportion of this plus this, right? I, analytically you can do that. Yes. Any other questions before? Yeah. Okay, so, so Android and iPhone, now the situation has become uh, trickier, right? Because you know, I, it's not, it, it, I don't know how reasonable it is to assume that they are fair play, in the sense that uh, you, can own, you can now own both Android and an iPhone, right? There are many people who do that. So we assume that they are mutually exclusive. Secondly, we assume that it's fair play in the sense that you don't, you, you don't have an aversion to one of the products. You're ready to adopt both the products depending on whichever is better, right? So that also is probably not true because there are many people who just like Apple no matter what, right? And they like Android no matter what for different reasons. So, so it, it, yeah, again, so that's a good question which might, might have been, might, we, need, we need to analyze that in the context of the given application, like right? in this data, sales data of Android and iPhone. You can fit the data and try to predict it. But what the main point here is that if nothing changes and if you don't create a captive audience, a, any competitor who has any competitive advantage will win out. So, so th that's the main uh, takeaway from this, right? Uh, and, and it depends on the situation. Any other question? Yeah. Mm. Exactly. Right. Ah, uh, that's also a great point. That. Uh, I say that eventually winner takes all, but what does eventually mean, right? Uh, till the end of the world or till tomorrow, right? So no, no, that's a very fair question. And, and I think that's an interesting open question. And so in, in ecology, uh, in, you're exactly right. Some of the models which we studied were inspired by ecological models. But in ecology, they haven't really taken the foot web into account yet. They kind of assume everybody connects to everybody else again, right, on a homogeneous graph. But the real uh, trickiness and the challenges come in when you assume that that is not a homogeneous graph, right? It's 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 a skewed graph. It's it has a different degree distribution. It cannot be assumed as a random graph. So yeah, I mean that's again. So you can think of the winner takes off result as kind of extending the ecological model to an arbitrary network, right? What that that thing can happen even if you have an arbitrary network. It was not clear and intuitive before that. But but yeah, the time to reach that is also a very great point. But uh, yeah, I think it's an open question. People haven't really analyzed that. No, no, on any graph. any graph, right. So before our paper, that was the main thing, that people used to think that it is only on a complete graph. But what we showed is that you can have this only, even if you have an arbitrary graph, it doesn't need to be complete on a very simple model. Yeah, good questions. Any, anything else before we, so this is kind of the end of part one and I'll move on to part two for five minutes and then we have a break, I think, right? Or 10 minutes, right? Great, good. Hopefully I've given you a sense of what we are trying to, how, how we can analyze these models, right? So, okay, great. So the next part of the talk, uh, of the tutorial is on uh, policy in action, right? Which is algorithmic uh, part. So here it'll be more algorithmic and C, uh, CS kind of flavor, right? So uh, the first question, because it ties in so well with what we have been studying so far, uh, whom to immunize, right? How do you how do you spread resources for immunization? So immunization, as you might understand, uh, I'm as you might have guessed it, that it's a very important issue. For example, CDC uh, spent like 400 million dollars for vaccines in 2013. Twitter strikes, and this 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 problem is not just in epidemiology, right? You can think of it in cybersecurity. You can think of it in social media. Twitter is uh, very very interested in trying to stop rumor spread because of trolls and all these uh, kinds of negative activities. And for example, rumors of victims after the Boston Marathon uh, did a lot of harm. So, so people are trying to detect and stop these things quickly and possible, right? So, so broadly, you can think of all of this as the immunization problem or the vaccination problem, right? So at a very high level and an abstract level, you can think of how do you choose best nodes and edges to remove, right? To vaccinate, to give vaccines to. For example, if I give you a vaccine, you will not get infected by the disease at a very rough 
abstract level. So you need to say that given a contact network, which ones should I choose? Which are the more central players which I should be uh, giving vaccines to? So let's think of it in this abstract setting. So I'll talk of that in uh, this setting. Given a graph GA, virus propagation model, any model, let's say SIS or SIR, and a budget K, you want to find K best nodes for immunization. And here I will mean immunization as removal, right? You can have different other flavors as well. So suppose K is equal to 2, right? So in this contact network, should I remove these two people or should I remove these two people? Which one do you think is better? First one, why? Actually, the second one is better, right? Because it leads to a chain. And a chain is, as we already know, is not really good for virus spreading, right? Here, there is a clique. Although this guy is disconnected, but there is a big clique here, right? Any one of them get infected, they can spread it quickly, quickly to the rest. But, but, but that's the point, right? That's the challenge. How do you really say that this is better than this, right? Is there a nice way or nice metric you can use to stay that, right? So there are many different uh, flavors of uh, interventions that corresponds to many different things in real life, right? So you can have preemptive in interventions, which is what many epidemiologists do, which is before the epidemic happens, can you immunize? That, that's what you ha do in flu cases, right? That you try to spread flu vaccines before the epidemic happens. You don't want the epidemic to happen. So how do you do these things before anything happens, right? So choose nodes before the epidemic starts. You can have a data aware version where you say that given that the epidemic has started, some nodes are already infected, what do you do next, right? How do you prevent it to spread further, right? So that's, that's the data aware version. And you can also have group based allocations, right? So typically I'm here kind of silently assuming that I can target this node and this node, right? Or this node and this node. But in real life, it's very hard to target each individual precisely, right? Because it needs a lot of resources. You can still do that for really bad diseases like Ebola and so on. But for flu, it does not make any sense because it does not make any economic sense. In that situation, you really want allocations based on groups. Probably, for example, you give vaccines to your school, you give vaccines to your office and say that, okay, spread, distribute vaccines randomly among your office, uh, office colleagues or, or your schoolmates and so on and so forth, right? So I, I'll go over each of these flavors very quickly, right? To give you, again, give you a sense of how you can utilize these results. So the first question is in preemptive, how do you measure what is a good allocation, right? So remember we had this thing where the first eigenvalue, thanks, the first eigenvalue is sufficient for most efficient values, right? For the epidemic threshold. That means that if the eigenvalue is higher, there's a better, greater chance of an epidemic. When the eigenvalue is lower, there's a less chance of an epidemic, right? Very simply put. So what does that mean? This immediately gives you a good guideline when you're trying to spread vaccines, right? Spread vaccines in a way that the eigen drop, which is the eigenvalue before and after the spread, is maximum. A very simple metric, right? It, doesn't, it does not need much uh, 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 intuition, right? If the, if the higher the eigenvalue, the, uh, the epidemic can happen if it is above the threshold. If you bring down the eigenvalue as fast as possible, then of course you will avoid the epidemic as best as possible. That's it, right? So the eigen drop, which is the delta lambda before and after allocation of these vaccines measures uh, how good the uh, allocation is, right? So suppose I have this original graph, I remove two and six, the eigenvalue of this is red, the eigenvalue of this is purple, then delta lambda is the green, right? And you want to distribute vaccines in a way that you maximize this delta lambda, that's it, right? So similarly for dynamic networks, what would be the measure, right? Again, we had this result about uh, lambda of the uh, system matrix. So your solution is very simple, our solution is very simple, reduce this number as soon as possible, right? So this is a matrix product. So clearly, it, 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 this is not a matrix product, right? This is the eigenvalue of this graph and this graph, but this is a matrix product. Now, okay, so at least we have identified the goal. The goal seems to be decrease the eigenvalue as much as possible. That itself was a challenging thing, right? But because of our previous results, you can this. How do you do this efficiently? That's a classic algorithmic question, right? Because this, this problem is not easy. So there have been many papers, so, uh, I mean, there have been many papers on node-based, edge-based, and these have been now extended in many different models and so on and so forth. So I'll talk about only some of them to give you a sense of what, what, what kind of techniques are needed for this. So you can be node-based, edge-based, you can manipulate edges, decrease the weight, and so on and so forth. How do you do all of these efficiently as possible is, is the main question. Okay, so let's look at the node-based problem, right? Where you're trying to pick nodes, K nodes, within a budget to uh, remove from the graph so that the eigenvalue drops as much as possible. Simply put, that's the algorithmic problem. So of course, the direct algorithm is too expensive because you cannot select all possible choices of uh, size K. Uh, I mean, just to give you a sense of how, why it is not possible, like if you even have 1,000 nodes, but 
10,000 edges, it takes like 0 0.0, and even if you assume 0 0.01 seconds to compute the eigenvalue, it uh, almost 2,600 years to compute five best nodes. So just to put these things in perspective that we talk about all these uh, orders, right? So like, I mean, even for 1,000 node graph, this is not doable. You cannot do a brute force algorithm here. So what's our solution? So our solution was first to carefully approximate the eigendrop. So you can use matrix perturbation theory for this, which says that, okay, if I perturb the matrix, if I change the matrix a little bit, how much will the eigenvalue change? That's what you want to uh, estimate and quantify in some sense. So you can do that pretty uh, nicely in this with not much errors. Then the algorithm would be to greedily pick best node at each step, and you can prove that the approximation which we get from matrix perturbation is submodular. And uh, and uh, as we'll talk about later too, I mean, submodular algorithm, uh, submodular functions lead to a pretty nice uh, near optimal solution in a greedy algorithm, right? So it gives you a one minus one by uh, one minus one by uh, uh, approximation, which is roughly 63 percent. So this is we get the algorithm net shield, which is linear in complexity, right? So from exponential, right, combinatorial to almost linear in uh, complexity, right? So again, details the just to give you a sense of what this uh, approximation is. So delta lambda, which is the, you want to estimate the eigen drop after a set of nodes have been removed from the network, right? So we roughly call it the SV shield value of S. You can see that this has two terms. What are these two terms made of, right? Again, to give you intuition about what these terms mean, right? So this is UI. U is the first eigenvector. Lambda is the first eigenvalue. U is the first eigenvector. So UI is just telling you what is the value of node I in this vector, right? U is a vector of n nodes. So u1 corresponds to the first node, u2 to the second node, and so on. Okay, this term, this equation has two terms, right? One of them just depends on ui square, which means the importance, the centrality of each node. So you can think of ui as just telling you how important each node is. Whereas the other part tells you set diversity, right? It tells you that how the nodes which are selected in S are connected among themselves. So what does that mean? If you just pick nodes based on node importance, which nodes would you have picked? You would have picked something like this. These nodes are all important. These nodes are all central in the graph, right? So if you just use centrality as a metric, you might pick this. But if you use centrality as well as set diversity as a metric, you will pick something like this. Clearly, this makes more sense, right, for immunization because if you select all the red nodes, you will immediately disconnect the graph, right? This is a much better selection than this, right? So, so the question, so right, so the idea here is that how do you maximize this? I can drop for each set S. So the result we had was that you can prove that sig SV of S is submodular and monotone non-decreasing. So clearly by Nemhauser's theorem, you get that net shield is near optimal and linear. Okay, good. Uh, I'm not going to details about the submodularity, but just uh, to, as a reminder, uh, you might have encountered it in other things. And especially for graph mining algorithms, it's, it's really a, a popular uh, 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 property which people try to search for in functions, right? that fs is non-negative, and if it is monotone, that means s plus v is greater than fs, and it's submodular, that means for all s subset of t, you have this uh, property which holds, then the greedy algorithm where you add the next best node, right? The best node which maximizes sv at every step, that all already is near optimal, so that's the main idea. An experiment, if you, if you just look at uh, some simulations here, you can see that lower is better, right? So this is the number of infected nodes, and this is time, you can see net shield leads to the best drop in the number of infections over like page rank between so there are all these uh, interesting methods and in fact uh, this one is very interesting acquaintance immunization which says that you 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 pick a random and this is actually what is utilized in real life as well which says that you randomly pick a node in the graph don't immunize that node immunize a random friend of that node right so it's called the friend of a friend approach so people uh, like that because it can be decentralized but you can see that we beat that too, right? So this is because this is really targeting the threshold, right? Whereas all of the other things are not really targeting the threshold. So that's why you can get a better uh, reduction in the number of infection nodes. Okay, and so th that paper was, uh, and the late, we have some latest results also, fresh of the oven, like all the, all the one year, yeah. Uh, actually, maybe we can stop here for a break. Okay. <laughs> So uh, we have the first provable approximation algorithms for the edge-based problem. So this was in SDM 2015. So we give a order log. I'm not going to details, but the idea is that you can get a, even a constant uh, uh, order, a constant approximation uh, algorithm for this, and you, which which is based on semi-different programming. But it's not very scalable. But you can get a scalable algorithm which gives you an order log and approximation, right? 
The running time, of course, more expensive than NetShield, but for cases, for critical cases like Ebola, where you really need the optimal results, then you can use these kinds of uh, algorithms, right, instead of the uh, other ones. Okay, good. So uh, maybe we can take a break here, and then after the break, I'll go over data aware and group-based algorithms.